Jenny and I were just talking about trying to remember when we met exactly, and we think it might have been 2007. When I was at the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design, um, Jenny was doing her uh, PhD and her dissertation through Yale and had um, received one of our craft research fund grants for graduate research um, during that time. And Jenny also was a speaker at our first Reviewing Black Mountain College Conference. Um, and so I'm very excited to have Jenny as one of our featured speakers today. She is currently an assistant professor of contemporary art history at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is completing her book manuscript titled Live Form, Craft as Participation, which examines the confluence of gender, artistic labor, and the history of post-war ceramics from 1945 to 1975. And it will be published by the University of Chicago Press. She holds a PhD in the history of art from Yale University and an MA in curatorial studies from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. From 2010 to 2011, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles and her writing has appeared in publications such as Art Journal, Art Monthly, Freeze, The Journal of Modern Craft, Modern Painters, and Third Text, and Text zur Kunst. So please help me welcome Jenny Sorkin. Thank you so much to Katie Lee Coven for organizing this conference and for her wonderful introduction. Um, and also to Alice Seabrail and Aaron Dickey for all of their assistance with this conference and all of the travel um, and organizational efforts. Um, and also to the Wingate Foundation for sponsoring uh, this uh, conference and symposium for all of us. Uh, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I'm actually presenting today some new research that I've, I've been working on ceramics at Black Mountain College for a very long time. So I've uh, come down to Asheville a number of times and I've spent time in the archives, uh, not here, but uh, when the Black Mountain Archive was in Raleigh. Uh, so this is some of the research from that period, but also additional research I've done. So I'm excited to, to give you a new slice of what I believe is, is uh, new and a different perspective on the ceramics um, uh, seminar that happened there. Uh, so here it is. A nearly forgotten moment in the history of Black Mountain College, the pottery seminar was held for two weeks from October 15th through October 29th, 1952. Ceramics at Black Mountain has functioned as a tiny moment, a mere footnote in the celebrated history of avant-garde art at Black Mountain College. Conversely, in American craft history, it has performed as a site of origination, proof that modernist ceramics was a parallel medium in tandem with the aesthetic hegemony of abstract expressionist painting. While media hierarchy at Black Mountain is certainly argument worthy, there is something darker that lurks beneath the surface of this bifurcated history. The 1952 Pottery Seminar is linked to Heart Mountain Relocation Center, the Japanese American internment camp located in rural Wyoming. Separated by a decade, the two sites are connected through the figurehead of Daniel Rhodes, one of the most important American mid-century studio potter educators whose presence at both sites complicates the legacy of Black Mountain's Pottery Seminar either as a peripheral avant-garde event or singularly important to American craft history. This paper advances the idea that the pottery seminar's importance resists both of these interpretations. Rather, it can be understood as an unexamined site for the racialized and conflicted histories of Japanese American and Japanese cultural identities during the immediate post-war period. Using previously unknown archival evidence and period texts, this essay investigates nationalism and ethnically charged theories of ceramics production, which conflated Japanese-American craftsmanship with Japanese craft. 
It is unclear who actually initiated the pottery seminar. The most likely candidate is M.C. Richards, Black Mountain's English professor, who first studied pottery with Robert Turner, the college's first ceramic and ceramics instructor of record, then with Peter Volkus, and eventually went on to teach ceramics and write the pottery classic Centering on Pottery, Poetry, and the Person from 1963. However, Richards resigned her post at Black Mountain before the seminar's occurrence, though she continued to promote it in New York and had planned to attend. The incomplete correspondence suggests that the poet Charles Olson, Richard's successor at the college, engaged in negotiations with all the involved parties. What is certain is that Olson turned to Daniel Rhodes as an influential voice in the field to ensure that the event would transpire. In the end, none of the Pottery Seminar's off-site coordinators, Charles Olson, M.C. Richards, nor Daniel Rhodes himself, attended the actual event. Yet Rhodes's administration of the 1952 Black Mountain Pottery Seminar is very paradoxical. In 1942, at Hart Mountain Relocation Center, he trained Japanese American citizens with no previous craft experience to make ceramics, with the intent to service a government that was holding them against their will. A decade later, Rhodes helped to ensure that three Japanese figureheads, philosopher Soetsu Yanagi, potter Shoji Hamada, and British potter Bernard Leach, an Anglo-Orientalist for all intents and purposes, arrived safely at Black Mountain to teach American student veterans how to improve upon their own ceramic wares. This is particularly significant in that less than a decade had passed since Japan had been an official enemy of the United States during World War II. At the time of the Pottery Seminar, Japan was only newly released from the occupation of American troops, which had lasted until April of 1952. In offering the seminar, the college was complicit in the complexities that surrounded craft, race, and nationalism in the aftermath of World War II. Yet its occurrence was also a reinvestment in the importance of Japanese aesthetics at a time when Japan itself was still viewed with extreme suspicion. But such a vastly enlarged consideration of the historical events leading up to the seminar alters not just the framework of the seminar itself, but American craft history, which has utilized pottery's presence at Black Mountain as an anxious guarantee of ceramics rightful place at the table of mid-century avant-gardism. The Pottery Seminar has been credited as introducing what craft his historians Janet Koplos and Bruce Metcalf call Asian ideas to the United States. But this is a wholly reductive interpretation of the real stakes of the event itself. In the span of two weeks, the seminar compacted a half century of disparate craft traditions that would otherwise not have encountered one another. Such a boon was unprecedented. The seminar set the stage for two decades of continuous development and expansion of American ceramics practice in and beyond the university setting. The seminar brought together three of the most legendary pedagogues of post-war ceramics, each of whom represented a distinctive tradition of pottery production embodied by the way in which they crafted their work. Throwing pottery on the wheel became a central tenant of craft curricula during the post-war period. This sort of live demonstration became a performative gesture of collective skill building that broke down barriers between students and their teachers. Shoji Hamada, who you see here um, uh, in the middle holding the vase, was a Japanese potter introduced to America as a Zen practitioner, Bernard Leach, his translator, the self-described courier between East and West, a Hong Kong-born Englishman who idealized the East, and Marguerite Wildenhain, a Bauhaus-trained potter whose work exemplified the symmetry and aesthetic perfection of European modernism. Black Mountain's pottery seminar also represents the first time that a Japanese potter, Shoji Hamada, came to the United States under the rubric of the avant-garde as a spiritual figurehead rather than part of an orientalist spectacle, such as the Japanese pavilion found at the 1935 California Pacific International Exposition in San Diego. As Robert Rydell writes, quote, the world's fairs of the 1930s seem designed to reinforce prevailing racial stereotypes, 
end quote. However, within the World's Fair's complexes, there was an even longer history of cultural appropriation as performance. Pottery demonstrations at these World Fairs date back to the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, where instead of Japanese potters, Native American potters were featured. In St. Louis, the Pueblo potters, Maria and Julian Martinez, demonstrated their craft and continued to do so at subsequent World's Fairs, including the Century of Progress exhibition in Chicago in 1934 and the Golden Gate Exposition in San Francisco in 1939. At Black Mountain Seminar, however, these demonstrations were not indicative of a marginalized foreign art, as Bert Winterthur Tamaki has written of Japanese and East Asian cultural traditions that were later subsumed by abstract expressionism. Rather, ceramics became a powerful metaphor for cultural diplomacy and exchange. The event's full title was Eastern Center for Interchange of Work and Ideas, East to West, meant to provide an inquiry into such disparate ideas as craft in the machine world, design for mass production, and master-apprentice relationships. While no program for the event exists, it seems to have consisted of pottery demonstrations, lectures, and plentiful studio time for the students in attendance, many whom were already professional potters and teachers from elsewhere around the country. In addition to this esteemed grouping of international potters, Soetsu Yanagi, the founding director of the Imperial Folk Museum in Tokyo and the leader of the Japanese Minge movement also participated as a lecturer on Zen aesthetics. Cultivated in pre-war Japan, Minge, literally people's art, or what came to be known as the folk craft movement, was an artistic movement spearheaded by Yanagi, who advocated for an aesthetic theory rooted in the appreciation of pre-industrial folk crafts made communally and by anonymous artisans. At their personal potteries abroad, both Leach and Hamada threw wares communally alongside a staff of potter laborers, which included their own sons. Such expressions of collective labor grew out of Yanagi's ideas, who praised what he called the unknown craftsmen, the anonymous communal craftspeople of the pre-industrial world, writing, quote, as in religion, a real salvation is found in the field of craft, one finally feels real self-affirmation in the abandonment of self, end quote. But the unknown craftsman ideal also held broad appeal for the student veterans who had already absorbed the collective ethos of American military life. So it is not inconsequential that of the 25 studio potters, 11 men and 14 women, in attendance, seven of the men were also war veterans, while at least two of the women had served the war effort. Active duty was a life predicated on extreme uniformity, down to the most mundane details of daily experience, such as dressing, eating, and sleeping. In everyday actions, the individual receded in favor of standardization, conforming to a routine that had become nearly mechanized in practice. This was a useful quality in the practice of wheel thrown pottery, in which the goal is to be at one with the clay, to the point where the hand's actions become involuntary or intuitive, working in tandem with the conscious mind. Such mind-body practices came to be idealized in the West as Zen a spiritual practice assumed to be the same thing as Zen Buddhism. According to scholar Donald S. Lopez Jr., quote, the hallmark of Buddhist thought is the doctrine of no self, end quote. In Buddhism, the autonomous self is considered to be the root cause of all human suffering. Rather, the path to enlightenment is the achievement of no self through meditation, the utter absence of ego. In this way, Zen and Minge became casually interchangeable philosophies in the American context. The idea of the no self became wrongly synonymous with anonymity. Doubtless a misinterpretation, yet both philosophies offered compelling alternatives to the existential crisis of the self that plagued the West in the years following World War II. 
Thus, the Black Mountain Pottery Seminar is one of the earliest instantiations of Zen philosophies being disseminated to an American craft audience, with Yanagi as its primary interlocutor. This is important particularly as John Cage has been seen as Black Mountain College's primary disseminator on Zen aesthetics. In reality, however, these ideas spread rapidly after the seminar, taken back to college classrooms, workshops, and community centers throughout the United States, where a number of the attendees were already professional potters and instructors. That is, they were not students elsewhere. They had come to Black Mountain to be students for the duration of two weeks. Anthropologist Brian Moran argues that in Japan, Minge came to be seen as highly politicized, indicative of a new wave of Japanese nationalism. British design historian Yuko Kikuchi expands on this claim, arguing that Yanagi's Minge was, resultly, was resolutely imperialist, incorporating within its definition not only Japanese material culture, but rather all the handicrafts of Japanese controlled populations, including Korea, Taiwan, Manchuria, Manchuria and Okinawa. Such layers of colonization are crucial for recovering a fuller picture of the era. While Japan was for centuries the dominant power in East Asia, in the American context of the Black Mountain Pottery Seminar, Japan was perceived as weak, a former enemy that had been dramatically humbled. In turn, humility became an important theme of the seminar itself, embodied by Hamada's presence. In her 1974 monograph, the potter Susan Peterson characterized Hamada's appearance as, quote, similar to the look of rural Japan, soft and mellow. He wears a treasured old kimono vest woven years ago by a friend, which tops the traditional country style trousers, which are cut fully, tied at the waist, and tight at the ankles, end quote. At Black Mountain, working on the floor with his hand wheel placed before him, Hamada became the living example of Yanagi's principles. Using the posture of the anonymous pre-industrial artisan, he sat silently on the floor cross-legged, a position Peterson declared, quote, impossible for most Westerners. This periodization is fraught with the exotic overtones that were perhaps more in keeping with the World's Fair era. However, Hamada's intensity was consciously conceived of as a performative gesture. By choosing to perform in silence, Hamada ceded commentary to Leach, who stood alongside as a mediator, adding a layer of Western style interpretation. Though Hamada spoke and wrote English fluently, he excelled at the role of the stoic Zen master, allowing Leach to translate on his behalf. Hamada's technique then was strategic and entirely self-aware. Accruing mastery through silence, he embodied the omniscient Zen master feigning incomprehension, performing the, zone, the Zen koan, a riddle or parable said to enhance spiritual awareness. By fooling his audience, Hamada perpetuated a blankness that, like a screen, allowed his audience to conceive and project their own interpretations. As an after effect of the seminar, Hamada became the touchstone for a performance-based sensibility that permeated studio, American studio ceramics. Such presentness had a shaman-like effect on the students, introducing a performativity previously unseen in American ceramics, which had become a perfunctory and maybe even rote exercise in object making. Hamada invigorated his craft raising the stakes for the next generation of practitioners who would also become performers of the medium like Peter Volkus, the most innovative and influential American potter of the post-war period. That a Japanese potter could become so influential is particularly significant in that less than a decade had passed since Japan had been declared an official enemy of the United States during World War II. This situation is framed by a series of ironies best understood as an outcome of American wartime policies. First, the student veterans eagerly studying Japanese ceramics on the GI Bill were the same young men who had fought and occupied overseas. Throughout the United States, the GI Bill was the impetus for university-based initiatives in manual arts and design, expanding college art departments at a rapid clip. 
Adding craft to university curricula helped to erode long-standing class barriers in post-secondary education. Intent on the highly skilled craft disciplines of weaving, wood, ceramics, and metals were considered to be forms of vocational training rather than art education. Intent on fostering practical careers, these programs were expressly aimed at student veterans. Secondly, Black Mountain eagerly accepted the government subsidies attached to student veterans, and it was only due to GI tuition reimbursements that the college was able to pay its faculty a regular salary during the post-war period. Indeed, some of its most famous students were veterans, including Kenneth Noland and Robert Rauschenberg. Two months after the bill's passage, Black Mountain College's bulletin opened with the declaration, quote, Black Mountain College has extended its curriculum and revised its calendar to meet the demands of the war. This was an explicit attempt to lure recent GIs through wartime scholarships, an accelerated curriculum which allowed students to finish in three rather than four years, and expanded offerings in manual arts courses, which included woodworking, photography, and non-liberal arts offerings like first aid and surveying. Additionally, a quota of students would receive deferments through the enlisted reserve corps while they completed college to ensure a future supply of officer candidates. Thirdly, the leading craft periodical Craft Horizons had credited the rising interest in Japanese pottery to the American GI, for whom Asia, quote, was an, indeed a discovery, a one-sided enrichment, of course, while the Japanese endured the duress of foreign occupation. Arguably, however, the occupation itself influenced the aesthetic choices of Yunagi, who advocated on behalf of a, quote, Japanese insight into beauty, a phrase which was also the subtitle of his 1937 book, The Unknown Craftsman, which wasn't fully translated in this country until 1972. The GI's discovery of Japanese ceramics was only possible because of the mainstreaming of Japanese aesthetics within the United States had been abruptly halted by Executive Order 9066, signed on February 19, 1942, by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, initiating a sordid chapter in American history in which Japanese American citizens were subject to racist maltreatment at the hands of the government agency, the War Relocation Authority, or WRA. Between 1942 and 1945, 120,000 Japanese American citizens were classified as enemy aliens, forced from their homes and communities and incarcerated in remote detention camps with squalid living conditions for the remainder of the war. Located in a remote part of northern Wyoming, which you see here with the blue arrow, Heart Mountain Relocation Center was one of the largest camps. At the height of its occupancy, the camp housed 10,767 Japanese Americans. As historian Greg Roberts, Robinson has written, the internment was not simply an error of official overzealousness, but rather a tragedy of democracy, end quote. Nearly 6,500 internees, a majority of the camp population were forced from their homes in Los Angeles County by way of temporary assembly centers in Santa Anita and Pomona, California, before they were relocated and transported to Heart Mountain. Surrounded by armed soldiers and watchtowers, families were assigned to wooden barracks that lacked even basic furniture for sleeping or eating. Many scavenged for scrap lumber to build chairs, beds, and tables, and other supplies to meet basic sheltering requirements as well as keep out the cold. Yet its duration, four years, created a semi-permanent site where beautification projects also took hold. This resulted in the unintended consequence of aesthetic production. As late as May of 1952, Daniel Rhodes took over the organization of the Pottery Seminar to ensure that the international trio arrived smoothly and received the supplies they needed. A student of Grant Woods at the University of Iowa, Rhodes had initially begun his career as a figurative painter, employed by the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, as a mural painter throughout the 1930s. In 1940, he became Charles Harder's 
first matriculated graduate student in studio ceramics at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred. When Rhodes completed his MFA in 1942, however, the country was at war, and there were few places to actually teach ceramics. Out of naivete, necessity, or both, Rhodes took a job as a plant supervisor for the War Relocation Authority, where he was put in charge of implementing a vast ceramics operation at Heart Mountain Relocation Center. The goal was to set up an industrial production facility that manufactured, manufactured vitrified, non-porous china for industrial use. The layman's term for vitrified china is dinnerware, or chinaware. Rhodes was at the helm of purchasing equipment, including a 20-foot tunnel kiln with the capacity to produce 6,000 pieces of crockery weekly, enough to supply all of the United States Army's necessary tableware. Rhodes was also in charge of organizing and training the on-site workforce that would produce all of this china. That is, the Japanese Americans in captivity, 94 of them in total. Such a kiln lacked any kind of spontaneity as there was no opportunity to make aesthetic choices, such as speeding or slowing down the firing process or creating a spectacular decorative effect through additions like salt or paper. Yet it was a marvel of mechanical efficiency as the camp newspaper, the Heart Mountain Sentinel, observed. After the first firing, Rhodes's army of ceramists would then trim, glaze, and decorate the resulting works, producing by hand a high quality finished product. Situated on 46,000 acres at an altitude of over 8,000 feet, the desert climate was severe, cold, and dry with frequent dust storms. As Rhodes described it, quote, our camp, surrounded by barbed wire and, guided, and guarded by a company of soldiers, was located in an utterly barren moonscape on the lower slopes of the rather sinister form of Heart Mountain. You see Heart Mountain in the background of this drawing. There was hardly a blade of grass to say nothing of trees. 10,000 people had arrived from California and were crowded into still unfinished barracks, end quote. Given Jap Japan's remarkable history of material culture, the WRA had stumbled upon the idea that on the basis of shared ancestry, Japanese Americans were automatic craftsmen with the innate ability to manufacture pottery. Under Rhodes's tutelage, they could produce a large quantity of useful and even beautiful china. In captivity, they could be productive laborers benefiting the very agencies that not only held them against their will, but also engaged in a systematic attack on their cultural heritage, for instance, suppressing their use of the Japanese language. This essentialism was compounded by the terrible working conditions into which Rhodes and his charges were thrust. As he later recalled, quote, 16 people, mostly young college graduates, were recruited to work with me on the ceramic project. We were given a rough shack built as a truck shelter, and we began to work on a pilot operation intended to grow later into a factory. We had no tools, equipment, or materials, so the first job was to pirate or borrow scrap lumber, pipes, bricks, and salvage from the dump. With these, we built workbenches, several wheels, and an oil-fired kiln. My group worked with incredible intelligence, energy, and goodwill. The Army loaned us a truck and a driver, and occasionally we were able to leave the camp barricades to prospect for clay. In sharp contrast to the primitive conditions we were coping with in the pottery shack, the War Relocation Authority had grandiose future plans for a factory with a tunnel kiln churning out Hotel China." End quote. While seemingly critical of the WRA, Rhodes's own role in this venture amounts to a puzzling collusion, as he laid the groundwork for a ceramics factory that would exploit the workforce he so clearly admired. It is unclear if Rhodes saw his work as a stepping stone to a more permanent position in governmental arts administration, or if he viewed his own role within the WRA as a contribution helping to enrich the lives of Japanese-American detainees through ceramics. 
But the War Relocation Authority was not a benevolent government agency as his first employer, the Works Progress Administration, had been. However, within both organizations, he was not a decision maker. He functioned as a low-level bureaucrat, performing artistic labor on behalf of so-called national interests. With an incomplete archive, we can only speculate as to Rhodes's intentions. But perhaps Black Mountain's pottery seminar may have functioned as an undoing of his own early work at Hart Mountain. Minnie Nagoro was the only known student with whom Rhodes worked at Hart Mountain. Rhodes was instrumental in her introduction to the medium and their association was lifelong. In 1943, Nagoro and Rhodes were photographed working together at the camp, one of the many semi-staged photo shoots taken by governmental photographers of the camp and utilized for record keeping. It is also, I should say, very well known that uh, internees were not allowed to have cameras, possess camera equipment, or photograph um, their own lives or livelihoods within the camp. All photographs were prohibited unless they were uh, made by the WRA. The photograph's official caption reads, Minnie Nagoro, an art student at the University of California in Los Angeles before the evacuation of persons of Japanese ancestry from West Coast defense areas, is taking up the art of the potter's wheel at Heart Mountain Relocation Center. Ceramics expert Daniel Rhodes is instructing several resident students for future work in the ceramics plant." End quote. In this image, Rhodes leans in, seeming to instruct Nagoro in the proper thickness of her vessel. As raw clay, the object was still very much in process, as was Rhodes's own teaching style. The photograph captures the intimacy of this individual instruction in which teacher and pupil are invested in a pedagogical moment while strongly juxtaposing the profound racial and gender dynamics. Through his unlit pipe, Rhodes puffs up his masculinity and expertise, though his youthful jawline ultimately betrays his age and inexperience, while Nagoro, seated at the wheel, is deferential, absorbed in the lesson bestowed. As propaganda, the image projects a benevolent bureaucratic viewpoint, profoundly softening the image of Heart Mountain as a site of despair and replacing it with the suggestive possibility that ceramics at the camp was merely recreational, rather than what it really was, a potentially lucrative investment for the US Armed Forces, an omnipotent institution that would eventually benefit from camp-made factory China. Born in 1919, Nagora was a Los Angeles native who had already com completed her associate's degree at Pasadena, Pasadena Junior College in 1939 and was studying for her BA in art at UCLA. With Rhodes's help, she was able to leave Heart Mountain and enroll at Alfred for the 1943-44 academic year, granted non-degree seeking special student status. While there is an official record of Nagoro's enrollment in, at Alfred for that year, it is highly likely that Nagoro resided at Heart Mountain between terms. During personal leaves, Japanese American military personnel were also required to return to internment camps. This perhaps explains why Nagoro would have been photographed with Rhodes in January of 1943. She was at home, forced to return to the site of her incarceration. This begs the question regarding Rhodes' decade la later decision to help organize the Black Mountain Pottery Seminar. In 1952, at a time when American craft was largely white and rural, was Rhodes actually working out of contrition? Was he undoing the biases that had crept in, specifically targeting the next generation? the student veterans whose only international exposure might well have been military service. For former GIs, the seminar offered exposure to an unseen Japan, the cultural and expressive possibilities in long-standing pottery traditions rather than its militarism. In bringing Japanese potters to America, Rhodes facilitated cultural exchange as a means of cultivating an appreciation rather than prejudice in the next generation of craftspeople. 
Rhodes himself maintained a lifelong interest in Japanese pottery. He spent a period of time in Japan during the 1960s as a Fulbright research scholar. Wholly influenced by Yanagi's concept of the unknown craftsman ideal, in 1970, he published the book Tamba Pottery, The Timeless Art of a Japanese Village, an aesthetic history of anonymously made ancient pots continuously produced by Japanese peasants from the 9th century through the mid 20th century. Yanagi's direct influence here is apparent, as he wrote the first Japanese language volume on Tamba pottery in 1956. Multi-use domestic vessels for the storage of grain, sake, and water, tamba pots were homely, lacking in color or decoration, yet they exuded an authenticity and what Rhodes called timelessness. Rhodes describes the audience for tamba in relation to the changing values of Western ceramicists. Quote, as he writes in his introduction, this contemporary receptivity to certain old Japanese pots is surely partly the result of the efforts of English and American potters who have discovered through their own work a whole set of values dormant in their own traditions. Suddenly for them, Japanese pottery became familiar and meaningful." End quote. Such a statement functions something like a rumination on the previous decades while concealing his own role in the matter. For Americans, Japanese pottery did not accidentally become meaningful. It was purposefully made so through Rhodes' own efforts at Black Mountain. Yet this occurred exactly because of the nationally mandated suppression of Japanese American culture through Executive Order 9066, which in turn paved the way for the reclamation of Japanese pottery. In the 10 years between Heart Mountain and Black Mountain, Rhodes's own knowledge of Japanese pottery would have grown exponentially as books and demonstrations only began to circulate in the post-war era. The potter Janet Darnell, later Bernard Leach's third wife, Janet Leach, confirms that in her description of the Black Mountain Pottery Seminar, of which she was an attendee under the name Darnell, not Leach, and Hamada's influence, writing in 1975, quote, during this two-week conference at Black Mountain College, there were many firsts. The oriental pots were just coming out of the basements of American museums and being exhibited for the first time since the long Pacific War. A few Japanese craft exhibitions were also coming over. Many of us had been studying them and saying, quote, if only we could get their fine quality brushes, our decorations would be better. But when we asked Hamada about his brush that was gliding over the pots, making beautiful, sensitive patterns, he said it was from the scruff of a local do dog in Mashiko. <laughs> it was obvious how far away we were from the roots of things in our preoccupation with tools, equipment, and technical know-how." But this elevation of a so-called Japanese sensibility and craftsmanship was at the expense of Japanese American cultural production, which was of course little known due to internment. In 1945, the politician turned craft advocate Alan Eaton toured nearly all the internment camps as a representative of the Russell Sage Foundation, a social services agency funded in part by the philanthropy of the Rockefeller family. For those of you who were at the Southern Highland Craft Guild panel yesterday, Eaton should be a familiar name to you, and he was very important to this region in terms of authoring um, handcrafts of the Southern Highlands in 1937. What came of Eaton's enthusiastic witnessing was beauty behind barbed wire, which you see here, which makes a direct connection between Japanese American internment and Japanese minge. The book opens with an epigraph attributed to Yanagi from his 1927 publication, The Way of Crafts. To me, the greatest thing is to live beauty in our daily life and to crowd every moment of our life with things of beauty, etc. Invested in rural, artisanal, small-scale workshops run by a master potter like Rhodes, Minge renounced the possibility that mechanized industrial production could be either creative or fulfilling for the studio potter. 
But as, a rural, as rural and collective as it was, certainly Heart Mountain was not the sort of pastoral setting for beauty and fellowship that Yanagi envisioned when he laid the groundwork for Minge, endorsing simplicity, functionalism, tradition, and the anonymity of the craftsperson. It is through Eaton, then, that Yanagi's unknown craftsman takes on another expression anonymity through unity, not simply racial unity, but rather craft as a unifying force linking all Japanese or Japanese-identified people everywhere, ancient and modern. Eaton chose to highlight the hobbyist elements of craft within internment camps. The book takes pains to emphasize the, beautif the beautifying program upon which the Japanese Americans embarked planting gardens, building and carving furniture, making artificial crepe paper flowers, and teaching each other skills such as ikebana, or flower arranging, which you see here, calligraphy and embroidery. Eaton conveyed the joy in handmade labor as an escape from the difficulty and monotony of camp life. Quote, it was at these camps that most of these arts were created to help them face the uncertain, disheartening, and confusing life before them. The Japanese are renowned for their ability to create order and beauty out of what is at hand, and that is exactly what thousands of evacuees began doing right away." End quote. In Eaton's version of camp, Japanese American craftspeople derived great satisfaction and pride from their reclamations and scavenging. From his hearty descriptions, it is almost easy to believe that internees preferred artificial flowers made of scrap paper to real ones, or that they enjoyed organizing tea ceremonies amid the drafty barracks. Certainly thrift and ingenuity are commendable attributes, but throughout his text, Eaton takes this further, essentializing these and other purported traits of Japanese-ness, which included a quasi-spiritual connection to the land, even that of the camp. Um, and the text that goes with this um, set of captions is the following. The stone carver at right is at work at Manzanar, California. Oh, this is not the caption, but this is a like caption. The stone carver at the right is at work at Manzanar, California. He brought from his native Japan a knowledge of and an interest in the slate and stone of the western mountains that could not have come in any other way. For he saw in the ledge of rock the ancient inkstones of the east, as other Japanese did." End quote. In choosing to portray, portray the desert and mountainous landscapes, camp landscapes as benign spiritual forces when in fact they were quite the opposite that connected Japanese Americans to their ancestral homeland, Eaton's book fosters a faded quality to Japanese American incarceration, as though their oppression held broad spiritual significance that was appropriately channeled into exceptional material production. Craft practice as a crucible for industry does not figure into Eaton's narrative at all. This keeps the internees at arm's length from the world of design, rather than being treated as innovators whose material affinities were on par with other war era advances, such as Charles and Ray Eames' molded plywood leg splint, they were cast off as amateurs. Both projects can, however, be read as a civilian means of patriotic support. And yet to know that the anonymous Japanese American craftsmen craftspeople would not have been recognized as patriots, much less citizens, alters the perception of how recent design history has not yet fully, fully accounted for the subaltern or the other. As the lead architect of the American craft revival, Eaton's views went unchallenged. But in reconsidering Eaton's 1952 book, 60 odd years later, it reads as a missed opportunity to have diversified craft at mid-century by inflecting it with a melting pot, decidedly non-white identity. Eaton's testament to camp-based innovations and object making could have gone far in securing Japanese Americans a permanent place in American craft history, working to expand the boundaries of a stiflingly monolithic narrative of celebrated white men. Wendell Castle, Dale Chihuly, Warren Eshrick, Wharton Eshrick, Harvey Littleton, Warren McKenzie, Sam Maloof, Paul Soldner, and Peter Volkus, to name just a few. Epilogue. 
By May of 1943, the Heart Mountain Sentinel reported that the ceramics factory had failed to materialize due to a change in WRA policy. Given that the kiln itself cost $27,000, we can only speculate that the undertaking proved to be too expensive or that the WRA realized its labor policies were unseemly and would have left the agency vulnerable to well-warranted criticism. Rhodes's final words on his role at Heart Mountain in 1984 offer an almost flippant disregard for the internees themselves. Quote, for better or worse, the government decided to abandon all efforts to create viable employment within the, the camps, and all industrial and crafts projects were scratched. This left me without a job and with nothing much to show for a monumental effort except a few token pots we had managed to wrench out of the desert almost with bare hands. So we said goodbye to our incarcerated friends, among whom was Minnie Nagoro, the only one who later became a professional studio potter." End quote. In 1946, after the wartime restrictions on Japanese Americans were lifted, Nagoro returned to Alfred for further study. In 1950, she encountered Bernard Leach during his first American tour. According to Leach's biographer, Emanuel Cooper, Leach felt, quote, much sympathy for her, end quote, and took it upon himself to, quote, help Nagoro recognize the value and richness of Japanese culture, end quote. There is something deeply unsettling about Leach's lesson that Nagoro, as a Japanese American, would be heir apparent to the Minge ideal. This is a form of cultural patrimony, conflating the significance of Japanese material culture with the ethnicity of a Japanese American student. The assumption that such a heritage automatically belonged to Nagoro was a way of categorizing her solely in relation to her own ethnicity. Such a viewpoint is hopelessly colonial championing Japanese material traditions, yet forcing upon its American descendants the burden or obligation of preservation. For Leach, then, Nagoro could only ever be a Japanese potter, a designation of qualification that would permanently set her apart from Caucasian colleagues working in a more contemporary idiom. This idea is one that the post-colonial theorist Kwame Anthony Appiah has long contested, that race is not a corollary of identity as Leach intended, but rather as a gateway to the cons conspicuous exercise of power, which resulted in his proprietary feelings on behalf of so-called traditional cultural, cultural objects, which he then transferred to the student potter, such as Nagoro. After the humiliations suffered during several years of camp life, coupled with Nagoro's own specific experience as an unknown craftsman, churning out prototyped army, army dinnerware as a member of Rhodes's wartime pottery workshop, Leach's well-meaning Orientalism could have been a particularly bitter proposition. Nagoro, however, went on to a successful career as a studio potter and professor, teaching at University of Connecticut from 1965 until her death in 1989, but she did not achieve national recognition. While Nagoro did not attend the pottery seminar, the oblivion of her career casts a shadow of doubt onto it. For Caucasian ceramicists, the pottery seminar ignited a long-standing American attachment to Japanese aesthetics, Zen Buddhist philosophy, and a vague correlation to spirituality that has long served as a frankly unsatisfactory explanation for the popularity of studio ceramics during the post-war period. For Japanese American ceramicists such as Nagoro or Toshiko Takezu, the pottery seminar and its singular focus on Japanese influence blotted out their own intensely political coming of age and the aesthetic choices each artist made as a result. For the field at large, the history of an almost ceramics factory at Heart Mountain, shepherded by Rhodes, one of the most beloved and respected teachers in its history, functions as a shadow modernism, 
an unsettling narrative that unseats ceramics as a forlorn and neglected discipline and instead enriches it with an uncomfortable amount of efficacy and power. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions and comments. Chris. Um, for everyone here, I assume Ruth Asawa also comes to mind. Asawa goes to see Hamada, the Hamada show, the lead show in San Francisco, and she's deeply moved by it, deeply impressed by it. We can imagine her as occupying a difference. I mean, she, who also was in a resettlement camp, as occupying some different cultural place than Mini Negoro, but um, I, I can also, in a sort of slightly more benign way, imagine that two talented women artists of Japanese background um, would not need Leech to get them interested in Japanese pottery traditions, that they would just be interested, as I am as a German background, interested in, in, the, in the Bauhaus. Okay. Uh, I haven't done extensive research on Ruth Asawa. The question, for those of you who couldn't hear, is really not a question. It's more of a comment about Ruth Asawa being naturally interested in uh, craft. Naturally is the wrong word. Okay. Um, reasonably. Reasonably interested. But that's exactly what I'm trying to call into question here, is this problem or the problematics of cultural identity, that we assume that somebody of a certain race, a certain ethnicity, a certain ancestral background is automatically interested or imbued with these sorts of cultural attributes that, that we often, this kind of assertion. I don't think you're making that assertion. Yes. And, and you're assuming that it was Leach who imposed on many Nagoro her potential? I mean, we don't. We don't. Know. We don't know. This is my interpretation. Yes, we don't. We have no idea what the exchange all was. I'm, all yes. I'm saying is that yes. is that Ruth Asawa, from a very similar background in California, went to the San Anita, you know, holding town and so on, um, saw Hamada and said, "This guy has something special." I don't mean naturally, I don't mean yes. just I just... But I think the difference there is that uh, Minnie Nagora never had the benefit of working with or meeting Hamada. She had no interaction with Hamada. Her only, her only uh, recourse here was Leech. She didn't go to Black Mountain. She didn't ever see Hamada in action. And she spent a lot of time at Heart Mountain. And then she went between, you know, she was at UCLA and then transferred to Alfred. And I don't think Hamada was at Alfred, or I don't know what his path was, but she certainly didn't encounter him there. Someone else, Julia. Well, um, I think what you presented is long overdue because it's a view of this situation that we haven't had before. And therefore, warrants our attention and consideration. But it's also an example of how paradoxical these situations are and how difficult it is for anyone to say it was this way or that way. Because, for example, you may be absolutely right about Mindy, but Ruth Azawa and I worked very closely in California for five years when she was involved with the Alvarado School Project, and we were both on Jerry Brown's art commission. She was a commission member, and I was the deputy director of the agency. And Ruth maintained that the holding camp was the best thing that ever happened to her. Yeah, with the Disney artist teaching her among others. And that uh, it gave her what society would not have given her, which was time. Unencumbered. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the very subjective experience that we have to, you know, we have to honor these people's subjective experiences, that it was not all one way or the other. But my point is, it would be foolhardy 
to take Ruth's example and say, therefore, that was the you know cultural milieu. It's full of paradox. And so I, I think what's valuable is to discover exactly the tension between the possibilities and give ourselves the awareness of looking at it across the field. And this one, you, you know, Ruth's, well, I should, I can only speak for myself. Ruth's is, of course, unique and uh, very much who she is. I mean, Ruth can make possibility out of a, a black cloud. I mean, she's amazing, was amazing. But nonetheless, um, we haven't examined it from this point of view. Uh, through it, you see, I came to know Dan Rhodes in his later life, the last 20 years of his life. Uh, I can only say, knowing him as I did, I felt heartbreak. I felt heartbreak personally uh, for the position he must have been in because a kinder, more sensitive, considerate <coughs> human being I, I never met. Mm -hmm. So again, it's there I think we see the paradox of, of how things can act in a single person's life. Yes, I, I totally agree. Thank you for pointing out the, the paradox of that. And I think that the paradox also becomes the kind of choices that one makes as a young artist that you don't necessarily think are ever going to have any kind of repercussion. But it was very hard to dig up this material on him because he'd clearly buried it. He had excised this from his CV. He was obviously ashamed of it in some way uh, it, from you know, my point of view as a, as a researcher and as a scholar. Somebody in the back? Yes, I think Mary Emma is making a point about dominant cultures and the expression of dominant cultures. Harry. You touched on this a little bit um, in the image of many being taught by Daniel, but have you looked at all at the, the, the gendered analysis of the way that we look at um, Ruth and many and their tournament versus other well-known male Japanese Americans who found artistic inspiration in their own internment periods? So. I haven't done that research. That research has been done. I don't need to do that work. That's, that work has been done for years on end by the Japanese American National Museum in uh, Los Angeles, which has a massive archive of holdings. They've done multiple shows. Uh, they're the keepers of this flame uh, nationally, but they, in terms of visual arts, but there's also a wonderful museum at Heart Mountain Relocation Camp, uh, which is to say that I think that these, I, that's not my work, and that work shouldn't be my, I mean, there's people who are doing this work. I'm certainly just one little, I mean, I'm, I'm not a historian, I'm an art historian, so I'm only coming at this from one particular, you know, micro-archival level, level. So no, I haven't looked at that history. I do, I'm aware of it, and it's out there, and it's actually already represented. Well, what I've heard from what you described it's not so much that their ethnic heritage is being imposed upon them by their British men, but they were 
Yes, that is true. They were at, they were, they were being asked to. They weren't actually being asked. They were being assigned to being a production potter for very little money. Uh, it was wage paying. This was not slave labor, um, and there was a need in the camp to be paid because you had to pay for your own food and supplies in camp, and so it was an anxiety to have to somehow earn an income. Um, and then, of course, it doesn't materialize. And in that sense, Rhodes is off the hook that this China doesn't get produced which is, I mean, it's just a fascinating history that has obsessed me for the last year and a half. Um, any other questions, comments? Katie. <coughs> you know, I'm trying to find, and, and really didn't get there, as far as, you know, Leach was sort of the messenger, or wanted to be the messenger for sort of Japanese and Buddhist aesthetics with ceramics and bringing Yanagi and, um, and Hamada with him on his tour. Um, and, I, and then I, especially at Lagnon College and the interest of Zen Buddhism that in general, you know, in a very sort of watered down version in the sense of like chance and how that manifested both with John Cage and then and the fine arts with abstract expressionism. I feel like we, um, have you come across any research as far, I feel like that's really, like it was definitely sort of used and exploited, but, and there has been some research about it. Do you mean Zen or do you mean chance operations? Um, I, well, I guess the use of chance, which came out of that sort of bringing over, you know, the, the there's a use of chance that's definitely talked. There's a discourse around chance operations and the I Ching and Cage. That's, that's certainly, I mean, that's a prevalent literature. Um, I, it's less prevalent in, again, um, I think American craft history is at a crossroads because we have a lot of research and it's all scattered through exhibition catalogs. And we don't have a, you know, there's not a compendium uh, other than the Maker's Book, which the CCCD published several years ago, you know, this is, we're beginning to do real scholarship in this field. I think it's very, very exciting, but it's, we're not quite, you know, there yet. I think, you know, there's a generation of people starting with Glenn Adamson and going forward that this is, you know, we're, we're, at, a, we're at a beginning. I think so. No, there is not a scholarship about chance. And when uh, this article is being published in American Art, which is a mainstream American art uh, publication, it's a peer reviewed journal, it's through the Smithsonian. And I've been through multiple sets of reviews with them because they didn't know who any of these people were. And I had to make sure that in my article, I had to go back and explain everywhere, all over the place, who Marguerite Wildenhain was, who Bernard Leach was, because the first peer reviewer had never heard of Bernard Leach. So, He's well known to all of us in this room, and he's dominant. He's a dominant white guy in our history, but uh, I, you know, he's still he's still part of a secondary tract in this larger American art history. So to me, that was a very funny and frustrating. I, the stuff on Dan and Rose is dynamite. I mean, I think all of us who know something about his career, that, that's that's just a gigantic fact. I mean, and and the. I like your probing of possible contrition. Another possible contrition was that he was doing industrial porcelain production. Like that was the enemy for Leach. And you know, Leach invented the whole idea of British handmade pottery as a as an attack, as a rejection of Wedgwood, Spode, all of Staffordshire pottery. And here's this guy who's got Two big secrets, you know? Daniel Rose, who then I think the next year does come to Black Mountain. And Mary Emma has a wonderful interview with him. He witnesses Karen Carnes naked in the boat in the first of these little happenings that wind her up, you know. Um, but to have an industrial ceramic with the idea of making porcelain in white, it's it's, a, it's, it's almost a bigger sin than, than you know, anyway. It's an aesthetic sin, that's for sure. <laughs> that's a very good point, the aesthetic sin of industrial porcelain production. All right, should we uh, have a little break? Thank you all. Thank you.